They don't ever want us to stay the same and leave the same. So I pray that we'll leave here different. We'll leave here changed by you. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen. This week, we are in our week two of our series on the book of Galatians. So last week we started uh, the book of Galatians. Uh, if you're new, well, most of the time I preach on topical messages, on issues, on different things like that. And they're four to six weeks in length and that kind of thing, kind of standard. Uh, but multiple times throughout the year, I like to kind of break it up and just take a book of the Bible and just walk through the book of the Bible. So if you ever know what I'm going to preach on, it'll be on something in the book of Galatians next week. <laughs> so just read Galatians over and over and over again, and sooner or later you will run into the verses that I am using. So we are in the second week of it. The book of Galatians was written by a guy named the Apostle Paul. And what the Apostle Paul did is he went, he was like a church planner. He would go plant churches all across Europe at that time. And he would and find cities. He would plant a church, build up a church leadership, leave, and go do it again. And just over and over and over again. So a lot of the books you read in the New Testament are books that he was writing to either pastors of the churches that he planted or to the churches themselves. Like, ah, oh, that makes a lot of sense. It really does. And Galatians is one of those places. Right? Galatians, last week we looked at a counterfeit gospel. We looked at how people were coming back into Bible-believing Christians who love Jesus and trying to get them to do things that were works-based, trying to do things that were based off of things that they accomplished rather than things that Jesus would accomplish in their own lives. And we looked at all that last week. All of our stuff is on Facebook if you ever want to catch up and see my ugly face more than you are right now. You can do that on our Facebook page. But this week we're going to look at Galatians chapter 2. We're going to start in verse 11. So if you have your Bibles with us, that's great. You can open there or a tablet or it's on the screen either way. So you've got plenty of options coming at you. So Galatians chapter 2 verse 11 through 13. Here's kind of what it says. Kind of what it says. Here is what it says. But when Peter came to Antioch, I had to oppose him to his face for what he was doing was very wrong. This is Paul getting in Peter's grill. Okay, I don't know if you know this, but did you ever know church people fight? Church leaders fight? Like, if you ever know anything about the New Testament, like, Peter and Paul were like, if there was a Mount Rushmore of the New Testament, of, like, people in the New Testament, right? Peter and Paul are on the Mount Rushmore of the New Testament. So here's Peter and Paul kind of just going at it. Peter, Paul is saying, I had to oppose him to his face. This wasn't something I could just write to him about. I had to explain this to him. I had to sit down with him face to face, because this is serious. When Peter first arrived, he said, when he first arrived, talking about Peter, he ate with the Gentile believers who were not circumcised. In other words, he ate with Gentiles, he was eating lunch, doing life with them, which is great. This is awesome. It's what he should be doing. He was doing good. But after the Jews would arrive, this is what we talked about last week, but afterwards, when some of the Jewish friends, when some of his friends of James came, Peter wouldn't eat the Gentiles anymore. He was afraid of the criticism from these people who insisted on the necessity of circumcision. Can you imagine that in a membership class? Ooh. <laughs> nope. Not happening. But as a result, other Jewish believers followed Peter's hypocrisy. And even Barnabas was led astray by their hypocrisy. So he's saying, they all started to fall back into their old ways, and Paul was like, I'm not letting this thing happen. I'm not letting this go down. All these people are finding hope, they're finding freedom, they're finding joy. In real life, real stresses, real pressures are getting back to them. Right? We all have real life pressures, we all have real life stresses on things, and here is peer pressure. Right, the day old thing of peer pressure is getting to Peter. It's like, well, I'm a little bit worried about what these people are going to say, what these people are thinking of me. So I'm just going to kind of go back to the way I, way I did. I'm going to play easy. I'm going to be nice. I don't want to cause anything. So I'm just going to keep slipping back. And Paul is ticked off. Right, this is really easy to do. You can be having a great day, and you just start scrolling through social media, and it can just destroy your day. You get news from work, something happens, and you're just like, dude, I was having a good day till so-and-so walked into my office, right? I was having a good day till this happened. I was having a good day until that happened. We've all been there. Let's just say this morning is for anybody who's ever felt that tension. 
of things going really well, having something happen, and seeming like it all just falling apart. And so Paul just kind of sits him down and goes back to the basics of Christianity 101. And we pick it up in verse 16 of chapter 2 where he says this, Yet we know that a person is made right with God by faith in Jesus, not by obeying the law. We have believed in Jesus so that we may be made right with God because of our faith in Christ, not because we have obeyed the law. For no one will ever be made right with God by obeying the law. The law is so strict, if you ever read the Old Testament, you're like, dude, there is no way anybody can ever, ever fulfill this. There's no way anybody ever can follow this. It's like, that's why it's there. Right? It was so crazy. It was so extensive. It was so rigid to show that nobody can ever do enough good works, be good enough to ever be on that same plane as Jesus. So how do we handle this? Verse 19 tells us, For when I tried to keep the law, it condemned me. So I died to the law. I stopped trying to meet all of its requirements so that I might live for God. That is a personal relationship with Jesus. Um, to me, so here's, we're going to talk about something this morning that doesn't get talked a lot about churches because it tends to split churches. It tends to take churches and make church people mad and be like, oh, I don't want you that serious. You're, we, you take this stuff way too serious. A lot of times we call these issues and we call these things deep. And what I mean by deep is different than other mean people mean by deep. When I mean deep preaching, some people mean big theological words that you just leave more confused than the way you walked in. You know what I mean? Like, they go, we're going to get really deep. And they start talking the Hebrew and the Greek and the Latin. And they start going through all these things. They're like, see, I'm really deep. No, for me, deep isn't confused. Deep is when I find things in Scripture that are going to be really, really hard to live out when we leave here. To me, that is the deepest thing that you can possibly ever have, is when you find things in Scripture that you go, that is actually really, really difficult to follow through with. That's deep. That's this morning. Welcome to church. That's this morning. Here's, the, here's, the, here's what we're going to talk about. Ready? Verse 20. My old self has been crucified with Christ. It is no longer I who live, but Christ who lives in me. So I live in this earthly body by trusting in the Son of God who loved me and gave himself for me. Myself, my thoughts, my desires need to die. My jealousy and anger die so Jesus can live. If we want freedom, we must die to ourselves. That is hard to live out. Right? That's hard to live out. But if we really want freedom... We need to die to ourselves. Welcome to church. It's really uplifting. We get to die. But that's what we're going to spend the rest of our time talking about. We're going to talk about what it really means to die, to lose ourselves, to be crucified. Matthew 16, 21 through 25 says this. From then on, Jesus began to tell his disciples plainly that it was necessary to go for him to go to Jerusalem that he would suffer many terrible things at the hand of the elders, the leading priests, the teachers of the law. He would be killed, but on the third day he'd be raised from the dead. But Peter, Peter's always the one who put his foot in his mouth. Anybody know anybody like that? If you don't, you probably are that person, by the way. Right? Just, I'm that person. It's okay. We can get along. We'll, we'll have a support group together. Okay? But Peter took him aside and began to reprimand him for saying such things. Can you imagine Peter? You gotta have some guts if you're Peter, by the way, right? This is the dude who like turned water to wine. Yeah, water to wine, not wine to water, water to wine, right? He took a fish sandwich and fed 5,000 people with it, right? Walked on water, that guy, right? If you see all these things happening, you gotta have a lot of courage, we'll say it nicely, right? To reprimand that guy who's done all that in front of your face, right? Like, so here's Peter, and he's like, no, no, no. But Jesus understood something. Jesus understood that Peter's coming at it from a human perspective, from an earthly perspective, not a kingdom perspective. Because Peter and the disciples still thought at that moment that Jesus was going to come and overtake the Roman Empire. Okay? They are essentially living under communist rule. Right? The Romans controlled everything. And Jesus comes into the picture, and they thought he was going to come over, come like come and take over. 
I'm going to take over. I'm going to rule and reign. I'm going to be your, like, I'm going to come over and take over. And Jesus is like, that's not how this thing goes. I'm going to die. And I honestly think as soon as Peter heard that I'm going to die, I'm going to be crucified, he didn't even hear the last part of that sentence where he says, yeah, but I'm going to raise again in three days. I think his brain completely just checked out. He heard one part of it. Because don't we do that? Someone's talking, they say a sentence, and you hear the first part, and you don't like what they hear, you can't believe they said something, and you don't even hear anything else that was said after that. You're just sitting there like, I can't believe they just said this. But you like miss the other 80% of what they said simply because of what they first said. I think that's what happened to Peter. I have no proof of it. We'll find out in heaven. But Peter took him aside, heaven, heaven forbid, Lord, this will never happen to you. And Jesus, so kind and honest, was like, okay, we're just going to let that one go. No, and Jesus turned to Peter and said, get away from me, Satan. <laughs> That's a bad day. You don't want Jesus to call you Satan, right? It's a bad day. It's a bad day. You are a dangerous trap to me. You are seeing things from a human point of view, not from God's. Here's a crazy thought. When we see things from a human's point of view, we're acting more like Satan than we are Jesus. I could have said an American point of view, but that would have made you really mad. That's exactly what he's telling. He's telling Peter, you're seeing things from a human point of view, not a kingdom of God point of view, so get behind me, Satan. Then Jesus said to his disciples, if any of you wants to be my follower, you must give up your own way, take up your cross, and follow me. If you try to hang on to your life, you will lose it. But if you give up your life for my sake, you will save it. This is deep. You want to have life, you got to lose it. But that's the opposite of everything that gets taught to us as Americans of all time. It's the opposite. I don't want to lose my life. I don't want to lose it. If you want to live life to the fullest, Jesus is telling me, you have to lose it. And when you try and save it, you're going to lose it. But when you lose it, you will absolutely finally find it. Amen. The question is, are we willing to give it up? Are we willing to lose our life? Are we willing to give up our thoughts, our desires, our goals, our ways to say, Lord, I'm going to trust you that your life is better than my life. The things that you have for my life are better than things that I have for my own life. And if we're not willing to say that, we will never give it up. We will hold on to it. We will hold on to our ways of thinking. We will hold on to our viewpoints. We will hold on to our finances. We will hold on to our kids. We will hold on to anything we can grasp for ourselves and hold on to the two because we don't really believe that God has better for us than on the other side. We think we can parent better than God can parent. That's why we put them in bubbles. Come on, right? That's why we do it. Quiet. See, if we were in the South, people would be like, hey, man, throwing hankies. But we're never in the Midwest, and people are like, yeah, we don't show emotion. We don't do that kind of stuff up here. Here's what we're honest. When we pray, we want God to change situations when God just wants us to change us. Right? We pray for God to change situations. And God's like, I just want to change you. That's what, that, that's what he wants. So he wants to change you. He wants to change me. And when he changes us, he'll change the situations we're in. But we want God to change the situation first. We don't want God to change us. Right? I remember sitting down talking to a couple one time there in my office and we were doing some marriage counseling. And all I asked them to do was is that don't cuss each other out tonight. That was their one, like, just, just can you do this? Text me tomorrow morning. Can you just not cuss each other out today? That, that's it. Like, that's it. I didn't think that was that much to ask for, right? Like, hey, don't drop bombs on her. Don't drop bombs on him. Just, be a, just if you got nothing nice to say, don't say it at all, right? Yeah, they didn't make it out of the parking lot. They wanted me to change the situation. You got to change this. We prayed and prayed, and God never does anything. No, he wants to change you. And then when he changes you, he'll change the situation. 
But that's not what our world teaches. Our world teaches kids, well, if you don't like the situation, you can just get a new teacher. If you don't like this, just go to this classroom. If you don't like this, just get this. And God's like, no, change you. Change you. If we really want life to the fullest, there's three different ways we're going to have to crucify. We're going to look at crucify. The first one we already read. Crucify our selves. Another verse that talks about is 1 Corinthians 15, 31. It says, I swear to you, your brothers and sisters, that I face death daily. Again, this is the Apostle Paul talking. This is certain, as my pride in my Christ Jesus, our Lord, has done in you. I face death daily. He's saying, dude, i got to die every single day to myself. Because I need to, because I'm that full of it. Right? I'm that full of pride that I need to die to myself every single day. All right. Welcome to Christianity, where we get to die every single day of our lives. Welcome. Join the club. See, I understand sometimes why we see different numbers and their stats and like some, you know, things are dying and this and that. Because when you come to Christianity, Christ is like, you got to die to yourself. And that's not always the funnest thing to talk about. It's not always the funnest thing to preach about. But Paul knew that unless we were intentional about dying to ourselves and our actions and our desires and our beliefs, we will go right back to the unhealthy, unbiblical actions. We have to be intentional about it. Right? Because this is just this is just normal life. This is just what happens. Anybody's ever had a really, really like a great day? Where like you're doing laundry and you're humming to yourself? You know what I mean? Like, doesn't happen much. Doesn't happen much. But there's days where you're just like, dude, nothing could go wrong, man. Right? Anybody have these days? Anybody got a favorite song when you're doing laundry? Okay, right? Man, I feel like a woman. Woo, doo, 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 doo. <laughs> the best part. I, right? I don't know. It just came to my head. Sorry. Right? Right? Maybe you're more like the Backstreet Boys. Right? Backstreet's back. All right. Or it's in sync. Bye, bye, bye. Maybe, it's the, maybe it was the, uh, the um, Super Bowl halftime show you liked. Right? You start making up lyrics to lose yourself. Lose yourself with the chores because you know you never want to. <laughs> All right, that didn't work. Like, <laughs> that was bad. Just edit that one out. <laughs> whatever it is, whatever happens, right? Like, you're just in a great mood, but it's laundry, and you realize you have boys. And you're, my boys don't take, like, when they take off their stuff, they leave everything in their laundry, in their jeans with them, right? Their socks are still in their underwear, everything's backwards and inside out. It's like Russian roulette. Like, you just never know what you're going to find, right? Especially a couple years ago, it was like, oh, this is dangerous. Like, it was, you just never knew what you're going to find when you did laundry with three and four-year-old boys. It's like, they're boys. I remember boys are boys. What time did that remind me? I stepped in a laundry basket, let's just say it wasn't water. I think I lost my salvation one day. Like, I legitimately was like, y'all are going to die. They, I was like, you're, you're busy enough to do it in the laundry basket in your room, but you can't walk across the hallway? Oh! Him and his friend did not get it like, it was not a good morning or afternoon for me. But anyways, right, you can be having the greatest time of your life. But dude, guys, that's my pet peeve. It's like, you know how many times I've told them, like, dude, pull the socks out, pull, take like the jeans and pull them out right, don't make more work for other people. You can be having the best day of your life, right? And you do it once, but next thing you know, it's like something sets you off and just kick the cat across the house. I don't kick our cat across the house. I really don't. But like, something just sets you off, right? You can be having the best day ever, and you're just like, what just happened? You're like, everything was going great until something just snaps. Right? And it comes out of the blue. You don't even realize it, right? This happened last Sunday to us. Right? It's 45, 50 degrees out. And you're like, oh, dude, this could be great. We had this great idea. You know what we wanted to do? We didn't know it was a war slash a walk, right? We had no idea. It was like, it was just 45 and sunny. We were like, let's just go for a walk. I didn't know we were having a war world, like in our house, but it was like a war just to go for a walk. It's like, it was a great day. Then Herod came over, we ate dinner to like lunch together. He sat and chatted for a while. It was like, it was a good day. But we went for a walk slash a war together, and it was like, oh, didn't know that. We have to be intentional. We're not slipping back 
into our old habits and intentions about not ruining hip hop songs as well. Let me preach. Sorry about that. Intentional about who you are as a boss. Being intentional about who you are as an employee. Intentional about who you are as a parent or a spouse or a student. You have to be intentional. A verse that's really easy to follow is John 3, 30 says this, he must become greater, because he's talking about Jesus, so that I must become less and less and less and less and less and less. It's good to be less, and it's amazing for God to be great. So, you know, this is, this is the part of the mission statement. Our mission statement is to bring people into a growing relationship with Jesus. This is the growing part. This is the growing part this week. Number two is this. We have to crucify our flesh. The biblical term for flesh, or that's our passions. That's those are our desires. Galatians 5, 24 says this. Those who belong to Jesus Christ have nailed the passions and the desires of their sinful nature to his cross and have crucified them there. See, this goes about against everything, because everything teaches you this. Just trust your heart. Just believe in yourself. Just trust your gut. It's, it's your truth. No, there's God's truth and our opinion. I have my opinion, and God has his truth. Right? And it's my job to make sure that hopefully my opinion is lined up with God's truth. But God's truth doesn't change if my opinion is right or wrong. Don't follow your don't follow your heart. Don't follow your passions. Don't follow. No, that's dumb. Right? That's really dumb when you're like a high school kid. You're like, you know what? Just follow your heart. No, that's going to get you in a world of a disaster. Like, don't follow your passions. Oh, just trust your feelings. No, that's dumb. That's dumb. No matter what, because what we're telling people is that no matter what, your, your feelings, no matter what your emotions are, no matter what you think, it doesn't matter if there's any kind of moral foundation to them. Just follow them anyway. Just follow them anyway. We do this with normal things and sinful things. Right? We're like, well, I'm Irish, so I'm just super fiery. Well, I'm Greek, so I'm just over-emotional. Right? I'm German, so I just shut it down and we don't have any emotions. It's like... Whatever it goes, right? We just we just come up with stuff. We just come up with stuff. I just ticked off a bunch of people, right? Like, I'm Greek, all right. Just the way it goes. Like, just the way it goes. Yeah, that big fat Greek wedding. I remember watching that. My dad be like, "Dude, that's my childhood." And I was like, "Oh, I know you a little bit better now, pops." Like he was calling his grandparents, and say, "Yeah, I'm Papu," and it's grandma and grandpa. That's what it was. We do this all the time, don't we? Well, my great granddad got a divorce, my grandparents got a divorce, my dad got a divorce, so I'm going to get a divorce. Or my great grandparents chewed, so my grandpa chewed, so my dad chewed, so I'm going to chew. We can come up with this all day long. And we just settle for whatever we think. God's like, no, no, never, you never have to accept the idea of, well, that's just the way it is. We put to death our feelings, our emotions. Our desires, when they don't, do not line up with Scripture. We put it to death. Live by choices, not by feelings. Live by principles, not by pressures. Decide now, even young people, you're going to live by principles, godly principles, so that when pressures hit, you've already made those decisions. You've already made those decisions. Parents, decide now you're going to live by certain principles so that when times come, you don't have to worry like, no, the, the decisions made, we don't have to live by the pressures. All right, we got to deal with this all the time with kids and sports and changing work schedules and all this stuff. We're like, no, we simply said, here's the deal. We will do anything and everything we can to get you to your sporting events, but you're not missing Sunday morning. I don't care if you miss games, man. It's not your money, it's my money, so... Whatever that I get, like, we're not going to do why, because that's a principle that we decided before they started it that we're going to make. You don't have to follow my lead, but you better get together as, as, as parents and go, hey, how are we going to make decisions? What kind of principles are we going to make decisions based off of? 
what are we going to do? Don't live by your certain choice, like live by choices, not feelings. It's hard to do. But we all have to learn to lead by example. How are we going to live this life? What are we going to do? All right, Joshua was talking about in Joshua 24, 15, says, if you, but if you refuse to serve the Lord, you choose today who you will serve. See, there's choosing between two different kingdoms, two different sides. See, no, 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 serve the Lord. So we have to make the same choice. We have different kingdoms that we can serve. What kind of decisions are you going to make? Make those decisions before you're put in a situation. Make them now when it's easy. How are we going to make decisions? You can make decisions based off of the lens of your life, or you can make decisions based off the lens of God. Here's what Scripture says, but here's what I say. Here's what Scripture says, but here's what I've seen. But which one am I going to choose? I have to choose Scripture. Because I can make decisions based off of the lens of Gary, but the lens of Gary will lie to Gary. <laughs> right? My lens will lie to me. Right? I'm Greek and Polish, but we run with our emotions. It'll lie to me. So I can't make that. I have, to, I have to go back to Scripture. I have to go back to have a foundation to say, no, no, these are how you're going to make decisions. The third thing that we have to do is we have to crucify the world. Galatians 6.14 says this. As for me, may I never boast about anything except the cross of our Lord Jesus Christ. It's always good to pray good Jesus. Because of that cross, my interest in this world has been crucified. And this world's interest in me has also died. And who are you listening to? What are you listening to? We get all of our information from the things that we put and the things that we bring into our own lives. Who's influencing your decisions? What are you listening to? The world has got to how the world functions. Right? Is, is it godly? Is it God's freedom? Is it God's life for you? Or is it something else? Right? Is it Hollywood? Is it the mommy blog? Right? What is it? Right? Is it whoever replaced Rush Limbaugh? Like, what is the thing that you are bringing into your life? What are you listening to? Because it's all flawed. Because so much of it has to do with a earthly mind, a human mind, not a kingdom focus. Not a kingdom focus. It's all about what we can do in America now. And God's like, dude, the big picture is way bigger than anything you can possibly imagine. But we're so puny that we can't really grasp it. And he's like, you have to die to it. You have to crucify the morals and the thoughts of this world. To die to it. Like, oh, I used to think that. I know. So it's hard. So it's got to be crucified. So you have to wake up every day and go, I'm going to die to this. I'm going to die to this thought life. I'm going to die to this process. I'm going to have to choose to die to how I've thought about things for years. And it's hard. And it's a process. It wasn't easy for Paul either, right? Because there's a time in Romans where Paul sits there and goes, man, I do the things I don't want to do and I don't do the things that I, that I do want to do. I think I said that right. Essentially, like, and you know this, you know this wasn't just hypothetical. Because I remember reading this one time and it dawned on me, wait a minute, if he's writing this, that I'm doing things that I don't want to do and I'm not doing the things that I should be doing, he's actually doing things. Right? We can sometimes read this stuff of biblical people, like these are just hypothetical thoughts that were going through his head that he never did anything bad. Right? Like, well, it's the Apostle Paul. He was like floated on water. <laughs> You know, it's like, no, 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 no. The Apostle Paul, when he wrote this, he was writing this based off of things that he was actually doing that he didn't want to be doing. I don't know what they are, but it'd be kind of interesting to find out. <laughs> right? Like, man, Paul, like, dude, what was, what, what did you do the day before you wrote Romans 8? Like, what kind of a day did you have? Do we have the same kind of day? Like, can we compare notes here? Like, what was that like for you? So he lived this out. That's why I love the Apostle Paul's writing so much because it's just real and it's raw and it's authentic. And he's like, I have to get up every day and die to myself because I can't live this life without Christ. 
that if Christ is going to live in you, then I have to die to myself so he can live in me. I have to crucify myself. See, listen, sin is fun. I'm not going to lie to you guys. Sin is fun. If it wouldn't be fun, nobody would ever do it. If sin wasn't fun, if it wasn't intriguing, nobody would ever fall for it. But it's only fun for a season. It's only fun for a little bit until you realize the traps that it has and the holes that it has. Amen. That, that's it. It's fun for a little bit. And then you realize, oh, this isn't as fun as I thought it was. Amen. That's the trap. That's the trap. So we have to understand this, that making certain choices, well, it's not easy. And we have to understand that we're going to, there's times where we're going to have to separate ourselves from thoughts and separate ourselves from influences and separate ourselves from things that we used to do or influences that we used to have, programs that we used to watch, people we used to listen to, people we used to admire. We go, wait a minute, that can't be the main focus of my life anymore. We've got to separate ourselves. You know, one of the things we have to understand when we talk about things, and Jesus, when people are always like, well, Jesus hung out with prostitutes and this and that. Yeah, but he was never the one that was being influenced. He was always the one being the influencee. So if you ever find yourself in a situation where you're being influenced, not, not the influencer, that's time to pull yourself out and go, wait a minute, hold on a second. Roles are getting reversed here. We should be the ones being the influencers, not the influencees. Are we the ones that need to be influencing people, not them influencing us? So Jesus was always being the one speaking life and truth, and he was the one always influencing. Where he met the woman at the well, she didn't convert him and was like, hey, let's go, you know what? All right, he, he spoke life and freedom in, into her life. She didn't influence him, him. He changed her life. See, we miss that a lot when we talk about, well, this is how this Jesus did things. Yeah, but he was changing people's lives. So we have to understand that there's times where we come where it's like, hey, I got to separate myself because I'm being pulled into a direction because of the influence my life. I have to die and crucify myself and my flesh to all of these things. You gotta die to yourself if we're gonna serve Jesus the way we're called to do. I have to die to myself if I'm gonna serve Jesus the way that God has called me to do. There's three big things that can help us real fast. One sentence, it's a simple take home. Have humility. Make other choices and choose separation when needed. There could be people in your lives. It could be a TV program. It could be a blog. It could be so many things. All right? I don't care if, I'll say this, there are people who call themselves pastors across the United States. They're political figures. They're not pastors. Just because they have a piece of paper that they call themselves a pastor. If they're pushing a certain way, they're political figures. We need more Christians as political figures, by the way. But let's just call it what it is. You're a political figure. You want to run for office. Do that. Don't call yourself a pastor. I don't care if their title is pastor on Facebook or not. Okay, but there's a lot of people who are like that. Like, no, they're not really a pastor. I don't, well, I don't care if they have a license. I don't care if they have a piece of paper next to their name. Anybody can get a piece of paper next to their name. All right? So, true separation, make other choices, have humility. So you may have to you may have to separate yourself from some people. Make some decisions and kind of go, oh, because you realize, wait a minute, they're influencing me, I'm not influencing them. My goal is never to be the Holy Spirit in your life. Understand that. My goal is always to show you what I believe the Holy Spirit is trying to speak into your life, open your hearts up to the Holy Spirit every week into in your life, but it's never to be the Holy Spirit in your life. I want to show you God's Word, and then we can all grow consistently each and every week. So, okay, this is what I need to do. This is where I need to grow. This is what needs to happen. Because if we're going to, be grow, if we're going to grow as Christians and be the people who God has called us to be, it's going to take us dying to ourselves and trusting that the life that God has on the other side is better than anything we can do ourselves. And it doesn't matter if you're 12 or 10 or 82, 
that truth is still always going to be true. You have to trust the life that God has for you is better than the life that you can create yourself. And you have to die to that each and every day. That is really hard to do. That is deep. That's deep. I preach on something that is you have to choose to do for yourself every day. That's deep. But that's what it means to be born again. And the scripture talks about being born again. When you come to Christ, it talks about being born again. Being born again is in a different life. Right? Being a Christian is in a different life. Being born again is a new life. That's why it's called born again. You're starting your whole life over again. Whether you're at 12 or 88, it is a whole new life. It's completely different. It's a whole fresh slate. We, we've dulled it down so much where we've just taken church and Jesus has added to it. And then when we get to situations and we talk through things and we realize, hey, we've got to change this and change this, people are like, what are you talking about? It's like, no. Christianity, being born again, is a whole new life. It's not an added extra. And God is saying, when you die to yourself each and every week, and you ask me to come into your life, I want to give you a brand new life. You can be born again and have a completely different life. You can be adopted into my family. I will do that for you. You just simply have to ask to be forgiven. And Paul's like, yeah, I'm hard. Because every day I get up and die to my flesh. I got to die to things I don't want. I got to die to old patterns and old habits and so many things. And Jesus is like, yeah, that's why I sent my Holy Spirit to help you. To be your helper. To be your confidant. I've got you. Trust me. But trust me that the life that you give up on the other on the other side is a life that is so great that you can't possibly imagine. There's ups and downs, absolutely. I was telling somebody the other day, I was like, I have no idea how people do this life without Jesus. I have zero clue. I get a, I have to counsel people every week. And part of the role as the chaplain that I have is like, I have to ask if they want Jesus to brought into the situation. And many times they don't, but I go, okay. I, I, I say this all the time. I go, I feel like I'm shortchanging you. Because I can only get you to, like, so far. And it, and, it, and it stinks. But you just have to slowly walk through it. And I pray for him after I leave and all this other stuff. It's like, dude, Jesus is the answer. Amen. It's a brand new life. Yeah, sometimes you're like, oh, this is so depressing. All right, it's been a quiet morning. It's so depressing. You're going to die. You're crucified. Yeah. Jesus has so much more for you. If you trust him, he's got a new life for you on the other side. It's a brand new life. You are born again. And it's amazing. Let's pray this morning. Lord, I pray for each and every person here. I pray for all those who, who know you as their Lord and Savior, but have not been crucifying the things in our life that we need us to, to grow in our relationships with you on a daily or even on a regular basis. Lord, I pray you would give them strength and courage to begin to do some of these things this week. Maybe even as simply as, as today, you know, as I'm praying, I'll just go, Lord, forgive me. Forgive me for not crucifying this. Forgive me for continuing to let this be my main influence and not you. For let this drive my worldview. To let this drive how I think rather than your scripture in your word, drive how I think. But I pray for everybody here who, uh, and for anybody here who would say, maybe I've got some religious background, but I don't have a personal relationship with you. This whole idea of being born again sounds really good. Lord, help them to know they have to ask for forgiveness. All they need to do is ask for forgiveness, follow you, Lord, and we've asked them and called them to crucify the things in their life they will simply lay them down and go, Lord, I, I give it up. I give it up. I give it up. I give it up. Because life is better with you than it is without you. There's hope. There's freedom. There's eternity with you. There is nothing but despair away from you. So Lord, I pray for anybody right now that would simply say, I don't have that relationship with you. Or give them the courage to ask for forgiveness and come to you to start crucifying the things that are in their lives. Lord, we thank you, Lord, that we get to have a relationship with you. 
He continues, you have opened yourself up to King of Kings, the Lord of Lords, Lord. You created everything on this planet, and you created us, and you did it all in six days, and you rested on the seventh. Lord, I pray that we will try to grasp a little bit just how amazing that is. That even after we blew it, you sent your son to die for us and pay a price that I could never pay. I could never do it. You did it for me. Lord, we thank you for that. Lord, help us to leave here inspired and convicted to change and do the things that you have called us to do. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen. God bless you guys. Have an absolute fantastic week. Don't forget, Wednesday nights. God bless, guys.